cooler much earlier in the building process, but in this case, well, I kind of wanted to save the best for last. Just for fun, I fired her up before actually putting her on the CPU to see the frost form on the evap and hear the boiling liquid inside, and oh, man, this stuff geeks me out. So you're gonna wanna cut a length of the included a insulation tubing battle. and position it as a boot under the universal hold down plate like so. Apply thermal paste to the CPU, preferably Arctic cooling ceramic. Put a plastic washer followed by a metal one, followed by a spring, followed by another washer and the included thumb screws and tighten down the cooler. Use your common sense as far as tightness is concerned. It needs to make good contact and, you know, compress the insulation that's around the CPU socket, but you also shouldn't be trying to break your motherboard in half. Finger tight only, no tools. Normally at this point in the video, I try to do some cable management and finishing touches and try to do a recommendation for a monitor and peripherals that kind of go with the theme of the build. But frankly, there's nothing left to do cable management wise other than plug in this fan that I completely Hello, forgot to do you. earlier. And then as far as peripherals go, well, white monitors are pretty hard to come by these days, so there's not a whole lot to say there. And as far as white peripherals go, well, if you eat as many Doritos as I do while you're gaming, I wouldn't really recommend white peripherals. So why don't you do yourself a favor, buy some RGB stuff and set the LEDs to white or something if you're into color matching. The well, linustechtips.com forum would be a good place to go if you want specific recommendations in your price range. At this point, you can power on the system by pressing the, you guessed it, power button on the front. And if the cooling system is already cold, you'll need to wait a few minutes for it to warm up. And once that's done, the PC itself will then power on and you'll need to press delete to get into the UEFI BIOS. Load optimize defaults, then switch to advanced mode in the BIOS by pressing F7 and make sure that the fan header your phase controller is connected to is not set up to run with any sort of a fan control curve at this time. We've actually got a full overclocking guide for this particular CPU, which you can watch here. But the key difference in this case is that we have the ability to push more voltage through the CPU without causing instability due to thermal limits and the inherently better overclockability of processors that are running at cooler temperatures. And I guess that's pretty much it. That's all, folks. I hope you enjoyed our phase change cooled whiteout build guide because I sure did. I was able to dial in a five gigahertz stable overclock at 1.4 volts with load temps in the single digits and low teens in a matter of seconds. And I hope this glam footage you guys are checking out of the system turns your nerd crank as much as it does mine because as much as a system like this is beyond impractical, I mean, we're talking a few percent better performance in games and benchmarks in exchange for a lot of noise and extra heat being dumped into the room that the computer occupies. Boy, was it fun for me to play with something extreme like this for the first time in almost 10 years. The last time I went sub-zero was with a chilled liquid setup that I built from a torn down window air conditioning unit. So uh, this is quite a lot more elegant. We've come a long way since then. I hope this was fun for you guys to watch. Thanks again for watching. Like it if you liked it, dislike it if you thought it sucked. Leave a comment at the link in the video description on the Linus Tech Tips forum if you want to discuss this particular build or you have any questions about it, that's a great place to ask. Also linked in the video description, a place where you can buy a cool t-shirt like this one, give us a monthly contribution or change your Amazon bookmarks, one with our affiliate code so we get a small kickback uh, whenever you buy stuff on Amazon. That kind of thing helps us out a lot. Thanks one more time Such to you guys for watching. Soul. To, uh, well, yeah, you guys for watching. Oh yeah, and the folks who worked really hard making this video happen, editing it, shooting it, and all that good stuff. See you again next time. Don't forget, luck always changes.
So today we're going to cover M62, which is a globular cluster. And like all the other globular clusters in our galaxy, in the Messier catalog, uh, it's a collection of old stars orbiting far above um, the outskirts of our galaxy. Except that this one isn't so far above the outskirts of our galaxy. It's actually quite close into the galactic center. It's only 6,000 light years away from the center of our galaxy. So it's actually closer to the center of our galaxy than it is to us. We're about two thirds of the way to the edge of our galaxy. And you can think of the galaxy as being more like a fried egg than just a disc. So it's a, it's a disc of stars, but it's got a bulge in the middle. And M62 is just sort of on the edge of that bulge, so to speak. Because all of these globular clusters, like everything else in the galaxy, have orbits that take them around the galaxy, sometimes through the plane of the galaxy. Uh, and in this case, M62 is very close to passing um, through, or has passed through, we don't know, uh, the, the, the galactic center. So these globular clusters, which I always think of as these kind of lone wolves outside the disk, sometimes they come sweeping through the disk, do they? They do, and they're not unaffected by that process. They uh, are subject to all the tidal gravitational forces that everything else in the galaxy is, and that can have a, a real effect on them. Um, and that's what we see in the case of M62. The interesting thing I found about M62 was its shape. It's actually quite elongated, so it's not it's not this beautiful spherical blob that you think of as most globular clusters. You can actually visibly see that the concentration of stars at the center is offset from the rest of the globular cluster. So it's actually being affected by the gravity of the galaxy. It's being tidally distorted by the gravity of the galaxy. And you can see that in other globular clusters. So a famous globular cluster is Palomar 5, which is not actually part of the Messier catalog. And in that case, you can see even more extreme tidal streams of stars being stripped out of this globular cluster, both in front and behind it, because of its passage close through the disk of the galaxy. M62 is about 21,000 light years away. And so on the sky, it's about 15 arc minutes in diameter. And to give you an illustration of what that is, I've got a five pence piece here. So we're in the UK, but it's not dissimilar. It's a little thicker than a dime, but about the same size uh, from North America. And 15 arc minutes is just about the thickness of that coin if I were to extend my arm at arm's length. So if we were to go out and look for M62 on the sky, it would be pretty small. It would be that tiny little thickness, uh, this little fuzzy blob, and we'd need to use binoculars or telescope to find it. However, if we were sitting at the galactic center and ignoring the fact that we'd be in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole and a whole bunch of stars, if we had a clear line of sight to um, M62, it would be that much closer that it would actually be about that big on the sky. And if you could see it, you'd get this beautiful view of this lovely collection of stars uh, hanging up there in the sky. day to night. You see those cogs turning? As the Earth spins, Venus is very slowly sweeping around its orbit, getting closer and closer to that. Hey guys, what's up? This is Neat Head Mikkel. Please thumbs up and welcome to the next part of the Solo Greater Rift Progression Series for the bar. And today we're going to be doing rank 42. Let's see what happens. And we'll look at uh, look at the gear and the skills and the setup and all that here in a bit. I'll turn the volume down a little bit. I haven't done this uh, in some time. That would not be wise. I haven't, done, haven't tried to push a higher tier with the barb uh, since like two patches ago. I think it was. It was before, like before the bounce to greater rifts, obviously before the IK set changed. So having a oh crap, um, having ancients available like this is awesome. What? They didn't even take him down. That sucks. Okay, that really sucks. All right. Well, uh, no, the... I will not do that. Do old school Raker style until they come off cooldown, I guess. 
I can trail him now, so that's good. Not enough hatred. We need to get a little bit more cooldown reduction. Come on, guys, take down this yellow, please. Thank you. I've become it's more formidable. The record with two piece IK is really sick now. Because it kind of solves the uh, single target issue. Time for that creature to die. I'm just gonna keep charging. Come on. Got so many hit points in the same. I require aid. How I feel about this density. It's not too great. Find it. Alright, let's do it. Can't complain about that. Absolutely no point trying to save that for anything. I am renewed. Just use it while you got it. Not this early on, anyway. I can get fairly ahead, like five minutes plus on the timer. Bleed, you filth! I need more hatred to do that.
I could get accustomed to that. I'm overburdened. I need to go back. I need to go back. <laughs> 